<laughs> Hello. Sorry for interrupting your lunch. I have the honor to present next uh, keynote speaker, Mr. Scott McIntosh. He's the deputy director of the National Center of Atmospheric Research. Before taking his current role as NCR deputy director, Scott McIntosh was the director of the High Altitude Observatory. Dr. McIntosh received his first class honors degree in mathematics and physics and he has his PhD in astrophysics from the University of Glasgow, Scotland. Dr. McIntosh's research in the field of solar physics has focused on three main areas. The detection and impact of magnetodynamic waves, the detection and understanding of ultraviolet and extreme ultraviolet radiation, and understanding the decadal evolution of the solar plasma. Dr. McIntosh has authored or co-authored over the 100 journal articles since receiving his PhD, including 39 as first author, eight on her public. His current high index is 32 and has approximately 4,000 citations. Dr. McIntosh's current area of work is heliophysics. He has um, this to say about open science. Open science drives innovation and maintains integrity. And now we are going to hear about... about the, the moon, the sun, and us. So, welcome, Scott. Okay, happy lunchtime, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Can everyone in the back hear me okay? All right. Can you hear if I whisper? All right. Um, I figured you wanted to hear about the eclipse that's coming up next year, but instead I thought I would give you all a lecture in stellar spectroscopy. Anyone want some equations for lunch? All right. No, I'm kidding. Um, all right. So, uh, how many of you are familiar with the fact that the, the moon is going to block out the light of the sun next year? Not enough. Okay. All right, so this will be some education then, maybe. So, all bad presentations start with an overview. So, in order to keep that fine tradition alive, I will present you with an overview. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the sun, uh, the enig or enigmatic star, the influence and impact that it had over the ancients, and also what eclipses meant to those peoples. That will be pretty short. What is a total solar eclipse? I will be asking questions after the presentation. You think it's a Q&A directed at me? No, I will be asking you. Also going to give you a five-minute tour of the sun's atmosphere. The sun has an atmosphere, believe it or not. It's good enough to have a party in. Talk a little bit about the magnetism of our star. You all know that magnetism is the all-important force. Um, and also um, my fine old institute that studies the sun every day and what they do. Um, going to move into a second uh, kind of tertiary section about why we study the sun. I'll maybe open that to you all, and you can all tell me why we study the sun. Um, and look at things like space weather uh, and all kinds of things. And then, of course, I have completely screwed this up already. Um, talking about the April 8th, 2024 total solar eclipse. And I will present you with some details of that, where to view that, how to view it safely, and provide you with some other sources of information. So I hope that this is useful to you all. I apologize for my accent. Uh, there's no closed captioning available, unfortunately. <laughs> I hope this projects well at the back of the room, but this is a little known fact that our tiny little planet lives in the atmosphere of a star. We coexist with an almighty ball of gas 
that belches fire and plasma across the, across the solar system very frequently. It also delivers all the energy to our atmosphere that we need to live, and that provides itself uh, to us um, in order to support life uh, and watch uh, a lot of things develop. However, what giveth can also take it away. We'll get to that a little bit, that the star is also very destructive. And for those of you that deal a lot with interplanetary space, um, if any do, you'll worry about that. So what is a total solar eclipse? I'm going to let this animation play a few times. It's really pretty special. By some quirk of fate, the, the moon's angular dimension is exactly equal to that of the sun. And about once or twice every 18 months, the moon completely blocks out the light from our star. And it just is a quirk of uh, a lot of different orbital dynamics. I've heard it described as a celestial ballet. That's probably pretty good. But as you know, you know or orbits, uh, as much as uh, Newton was a genius, there are small deviations around Newton's explanations of gravitational um, effects. I won't get into those because I, I don't know how good everyone is with a tensor. But um, what happens is that our, the shadow of the moon follows, falls upon our planet in different places. And so depending on the orientation of the Earth relative to the sun, the orientation of the moon relative to the Earth, and all these other factors determines where that shadow is going to fall. Okay. A total solar eclipse has three kind of key points. And who's seen a total solar eclipse? OK, if those of you who have seen it, was it the most spectacular thing you've ever seen in your life? All right. Who's seen the aurora? Oh, it's about the same. Was that the most spectacular thing you've seen in your life? It's pretty cool, right? Thank goodness. All right. So what is a total solar eclipse? So that, remember I said that this angular dimension it's funny that the geometry works out exactly such that the moon blocks out the light from the star. But a bit like Pac-Man, you know, the moon, it makes a thing called first contact. So about 90 minutes ahead of totality when everything goes dark, the moon starts to take a little nibble out of the sun. Then it starts to form a crescent. When it's almost encrusted and you start to see a lot of phenomena on the sun that stick out. It's, it's funny, it's, it's very interesting that um, back in the day when they were determining what a lot of solar terminology was, when they looked at the sun in eclipses, was the only way to, to view this kind of very eph ephemeral cloud around the sun. But when they were looking at that, they noticed these big red objects that were very prominent suspended clouds above the atmosphere of the star. And, and not to give too much away about my colleagues and how we name things, those are still called prominences because they were prominent. So don't let that cause you any indigestion. But prominences will be very visible in this phase of totality near second contact and moving into totality. There's all kinds of other interesting phenomena. There's this thing called the diamond ring. I don't know if you remember seeing it. There was a very prominent diamond ring in 2017. Um, and that's largely caused by um, the craters on the moon. Right? So slight irregularities. You know the moon is slightly irregular, right? Has stuff on it. And the stuff on it causes the light to leak around the side of this, the moon very weirdly. And that produces phenomena like um, Bailey's beads. You probably can't see that. So it's like a, a, a ribbon of beads around the, earth, uh, around the limb. And then you get the same uh, effect with the diamond ring. So then over the space of about 90 minutes, this passes on to third contact. By this point, everyone's drunk. 
maybe falling off of the beach that they happen to be on. Because funnily enough, most eclipses occur near beaches. Don't know why. Um, and then by force contact, everyone's gone home. So 90 minutes later. Okay? So that is uh, about 180 minutes in the life of a human. But when the sun, when the moon perfectly blocks out the light from the star, a ghost is revealed. And that shimmering ghost is called the sun's corona or its crown, right? Have you seen, you saw the sun's corona, if you saw the eclipse. The corona is, is a weird thing. Anyone want to tell me what temperature the, the, the cloud of gas around the star happens to be? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? It's a million degrees. What's the surface temperature of the sun? Anyone? Bueller? A wee bit less than? Or a three orders of magnitude less than? 5,000, 6,000 degrees. Okay? So somehow there's a cloud of gas around our star that's about a million degrees hotter than the surface of our star. For those of you that worry about the laws of thermodynamics, don't worry, there's an explanation, okay? All right. But this is a mystery. And when in, in ancient times, and I'll, I'll prelude myself a little bit, when they saw this cloud of gas around the star, they thought it was very strange. And before we understood what it was in 1943, not that long ago, they, they decided that it required a new element of the periodic table called coronium to explain it, right? Some mystical gas that lives around the star. And, you know, as, as the theme will be imagine, imagination, so it comes from the corona, therefore we call it coronium. Just like prominent things above the limb that we call prominences. S spots on the sun that we call sunspots. I'm looking at John a lot, it's my feedback mechanism, so. <laughs> But the corona, one of the, one of the still enigmatic mysteries of our star is how the hell can you pump energy into a cloud of gas around it and sustain it at a million degrees when the surface of the star itself is only a few thousand degrees? And that gets into the unpronounceable magnetohydrodynamics effects. Who's heard of magnetohydrodynamics? Who's heard of hydrodynamics? Magnetohydrodynamics is what happens when you blend in Maxwell's equations and you give yourself uh, aneurysm. <laughs> okay? So here's a beautiful view. I don't know if you can see this. So from geosynchronous orbit, what does that shadow look like? Can you see the shadow? Isn't CG wonderful? No, it's real. Right, so there's an observatory out there. It uh, used to be called Triana. It's not called Triana anymore. But it sits out there at the Lagrange point between the Earth and the Sun, about a million and a half miles upstream. And it catches the shadow of the moon blocking, walking across. That's actually the eclipse day on 2017 from space. Now, this isn't, uh, this isn't Star Wars. But if you want to see how that looks from even deeper space, here you go. There's the Death Star. About to blow up um, Alderaan. Okay? It's not really. Don't get alarmed. Right? That big crater is not a, a pulse laser rifle. But I thought this movie was spectacular, so I thought I would throw it in. Kind of irrelevant, but funny. And many of you have heard analogs, and who's seen uh, Mel Gibson's movie, Apocalypto? Anyone? Wow. It ends with a total solar eclipse. Doesn't end well, though. Really doesn't. But the ancients in ancient civilizations saw the moon and the sun, and of course, many of them worship the sun uh, and worship the moon. And, and many, even the ancient Babylonians, as I'll get to in a second, uh, figured out a lot of astronomy um, 27 centuries ago. <laughs> so they didn't really leave much for us. But 
we just insist upon the fact that we ignore what they did. Anyway, so they built a lot of temples and they built a lot of calendars like Stonehenge and a lot of other standing stones, things as well, back to the Stone Age, Bronze Age and beyond. Some of you may have heard um, some of the urban myths around eclipses and kings and queens. Anyone want to share one? No? Well, it's my job, right? Is that my job? All right. What's the anecdote? Don't be born on the day of an eclipse. Otherwise, your whole family will die. So, so the Elizabethans uh, warned. And I think a young prince died one day during a totality of an eclipse, and it was blamed upon the eclipse. I don't think the eclipse had anything to do with it personally. But one of the interesting things is that, you know, some wicked number of years ago, some philosophers, because, you know, back in the day, physics was called philosophy, figured out the entire math of eclipses. They were so important to their religious and their social calendars that they basically took um, tablets and inscripted all the equations. So there's my equations. Can you read them? They encrypted all those on um, stone um, tablets, bronze tablets, and they basically figured out that the, the, there was key phases of how the sun, the moon, and the earth interact over these cycles of about 18 months to repeat and produce this bizarre event. And of course, if you lived 22 centuries ago, and you had the ability to predict when the light from the sun in the middle of the day was going to go out, you had infinite power. Isn't infinite power awesome? <laughs> and also, one of the weird things is they built an analog computer some, some centuries later to understand and predict this. Who's heard of the Antikythera mechanism? Who's seen it? <laughs> I got you all again. Um, fascinating object, right? So if you ever find yourself in Greece, I, I think you should go to the National Museum and see this object. It's basically an analog computer that was on a ship. So it was probably a lot like a sextant would be in Elizabethan or later times for navigation, it was to, to establish your timing. But it also uh, didn't just establish your local timing, it established when eclipses were going to occur, and it was to helpful with tides and things. So uh, I think they kind of nailed it. They had a little pocket iPhone made of bronze. One of the other famous eclipse events, um, and this is where you get to old, name the old duffer. Can you see the three old duffers? Name them. Anyone? One of them's Arthur Eddington. He's famous for many things. He was a great philosopher. Another is Albert Einstein. He's pretty famous, I think. I think I've heard the name. And Einstein, one of Einstein's theories was tested in 1919. In fact, I think it was the canonical test for general relativity. And the fact that the light from a star would be bent by the gravity of the sun. So astronomers would project that the star should be in a certain place in the sky. The eclipse happened, and so you can reveal the stars in the middle of the daytime. And guess what? The star wasn't where it was meant to be, but it was exactly the right amount that if the light was being bent by a gravitational object, that's where it would appear. And bravo. Professor Einstein wins his Nobel Prize, right? Before the Nobel Prize has actually existed. The other thing that happened, um, I talked a little bit about coronium earlier, was the discovery of helium. Happened during a total solar eclipse. So that, again, this is where I get into my nerd-fueled speech about spectroscopy. I'm a fully trained ultraviolet spectroscopist. And that gets even nastier when you add magnetic fields, and I won't get there. I, I won't go back to my um, magnetohydrodynamics. By the end of this presentation, everyone has to yell out magnetohydrodynamics. <laughs> and just because I love eye candy, 
I'm going to rewind this a little bit. Oh, excuse me. I've sped this up four times, and I can't get enough of it. Because someone will be familiar with this. Did anyone see this? I think this is another Patagonian eclipse from 20 years ago. Not quite. 12 years ago. That's not fake. That's not CG. Okay? That is not a UFO plant itself inside. Do you see the shadow? You can physically see the shadow. You can feel the shadow. The temperature in the, around you drops by about 10 degrees almost instantly. It's amazing. The birds stop. I think it's the thing that everybody kind of remarks upon. The insects shut up. And then the sun pops back out again. And then boom, 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 nothing ever happens. That's just to whet your appetite for the boring part that's about to come. The, who knows about the inside of our star? Raise your hands. Oh, right, okay, stand up. <laughs> I want you to read the next few slides, okay? The sun is predominantly hydrogen. Some wicked amount of hydrogen, 71% hydrogen. And the density of the hydrogen at the core of the sun, given its massive gravity, produces somewhere in the region of, oh man, I've got to get this number right, 400 bajillion watts. I think that's a bajillion. 28% helium, which is of course come from the fusion of hydrogen. And then there's um, a whole bunch of trace elements, like the unimportant ones, like nitrogen and oxygen and carbon. Uh, 1.3 million Earths fit inside of the sun. That's a few. And it has a density of core, uh, its core that's 150 times greater than water. And if anyone's tried to pick up um, uh, five gallons of water would know that that's, uh, that's a pretty thing. However, and this is a battle that I rage within my own community, most astronomers consider the sun to be incredibly dull and boring. Why is that? Be middle, middle no, it's because none of their models work. Ah! Every good astronomical model works until you apply it to the sun. Just remember that. If there's a take-home message from this presentation, that is it. Now, this rather bland piece of atmosphere is actually evolving. And since my mic is working, I want you to pay attention to the movies on the right, uh, upper left-hand side here as I carefully dodge the cables. That's actually moving. Doesn't look like much right now. There's actually a very small sunspot on that disk that's rotating around and around and around. And that part of the sun is about 6,000 degrees Kelvin. If I pop up just a few kilometers, the sun looks a little bit different. This part of the sun's at about 10,000 degrees, so it's already getting that little bit hotter. If I jump up to about 100,000 degrees, and up a few further kilometers, or hundreds of kilometers, the shape of the solar atmosphere is starting to change dramatically. So you notice how it went from being a boring sphere to having structure. And this is, of course, the ultraviolet sun. And it's got lots of structure. As I go up further, it actually starts to look like an Ewok. Did you know that? I don't think George Lucas appreciates that. <laughs> but the sun becomes very highly structured. What is structuring the outer atmosphere of the sun? Anyone? Whoa! Cookie for that person. Yes, the magnetic field. So it's somewhere through the sun's outer atmosphere. The evolution has gone from one that's purely hydrodynamic to one that's purely magnetic. Right? So this is why astronomers don't worry about Maxwell's equations. It's too damn complicated. There you go, Teddy Ruxpin, Ewok, whatever you want to call it. Poke it out. Coronal holes in the middle there. So that is the two, two million degree corona. The coronal gas gets up to about 10 million degrees. When the sun flares like it did last night, it gets to about 100 million degrees locally. That's fairly hot. 
for anyone in the room. Every now and again, the sun likes to belch, just like us all. It can't keep that very hot plasma confined very well. And it produces storms. And if you watch that movie on the upper right hand side, that's our teenage star just letting off steam. The thing at the core of this, and again, all these movies are taken over the same month. How you look at the sun, the wavelength you look at the sun is very different, very important to what you see. The sun is pockmarked with magnetic field. That magnetic field is con created magically in the sun's interior and it pokes through the surface and it shapes all those structures that I showed you. And in fact, it even makes analytical models uh, like the one on the left hand side. So that is actually the magnetic field that protrudes from the star shown in, in relief. The green lines and the pink lines are all open magnetic fields, so they basically go out to the end of the solar system and connect. And the white ones are all confined plasma. But as I said, when you take the bottom and you make it evolve all the time, the thing becomes rather tempestuous. Okay? You see, the, you see the comets? The comets did not create that big explosion. Watch the bottom. Here they come. Two comets come streaming in. Where are you? There they are. You see them? Boom. You don't want to be in the way of one of those storms. So space weather is, is the, the gift from our generous star. Those tempestuous belches travel across space-time, the 93 million miles to Earth, whack our little protective envelope, the magnetosphere, drive energy into the system, which then cascades down and appears as what? Lunch, people. Oh, okay, we're learning. We're learning. It's okay. I'm proud of you. You're breaking my heart. All right. If you're in the space station, one of those things is probably not good for your health. Lead underpants. But what I'll say is, if some of the first movies I saw from the space station of flying over the Aurora are truly, truly spectacular. There's a couple of. There's one example. And the one on the right hand side is from Scotland, actually. And if you've ever been to Scotland, it's very rare to see the aurora because, you know, the clouds don't let you. In fact, in Scotland, the sun is a purely theoretical object. <laughs> Why do we study the sun? You know, this is part of my day job. The power grid is vulnerable to disruptions from our star. Infrastructure in space is vulnerable to impacts from our star. Believe it or not, the financial systems are very, very vulnerable to impacts from our star because they rely on GPS timing. Um, of course, there's military applications, we'll get into. Um, but there's also the health and safety of astronauts. I work with a lot of guys at Johnson Space Flight Center and um, the, the recent uptick in solar activity is a constant concern to them. But um, our lack of uh, finesse in forecasting the sun's tempestuous outbursts cost the government probably about somewhere in the region of $10 billion a year. If a large storm were to go off and obliterate a lot of infrastructure, you're talking trillions of dollars in a year. Maybe, maybe tens of trillions of dollars. Pretty soon it's real money. Okay, so off the boring bit and into the eclipses. As I said, the ancient Babylonians and uh, Persians discovered the math of eclipses a long, long, long time ago. But this allows nerds worldwide to create websites. And nerds worldwide create beautiful websites dedicated to eclipses. And this is a graphic that I stole from a beautiful website that you can all look up, greatamericaneclipse.com. It is powered by nerds. And they're very good nerds. And they've spent a lot of time and energy 
looking at all of the 21st century eclipses, so everything you could possibly want to know about all the eclipses for the next 100 years is right there, because the math can all be done in my iPhone now. You don't need an anti cathode mechanism, unfortunately. And so this leads us to the event of the decade, next April, April 8th, mark your calendars, as the sun and its totality traverses across the spine of this country and uh, the central belt of, of Mexico. You were all aware that that was going to happen, right? 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 Are you guys going to sleep? What did you put in lunch? All right. And, and as far as completely unreadable graphics are concerned, I think this wins. But I can read it really well. And so, the un unlike 2017, this eclipse travels through so many major metropolitan areas that it's going to be special. They're talking somewhere in the region of 200 million people in the path of totality without having to go anywhere. Now, there was a little bit of a concern in 2017 that would actually make the country fold in half because everyone would rush into the Mississippi Belt. <laughs> it's okay, it didn't actually happen. But in this case, if you're going to go somewhere, there's plenty of places on the beach. And if you can't go to a beach, you can make your own because they do say that eclipses look better on the beach. I won't get into, I'm going to share some details with you, but I, I would, there was no point in recreating any of these graphics. I'm joking that they're powered by nerds, but it's truly spectacular what, um, what the amateur astronomers and the professional ones can create around eclipses. And I just wanted to showcase some of this. So, I don't know where you're all planning to be, or if you're even planning to go at all. And some of this material can be distributed, and I'll make these slides available for a small fee. <laughs> um, some great places, Paducah, Kentucky. Who's been to Paducah, Kentucky? They have the best pancakes there. The funny thing about this eclipse, 2017 was only two minutes. So it wasn't really enough time to get drunk. This one's going to be four and a half minutes, okay, roughly, give or take a few seconds. What's a few seconds between friends? Uh, but that's plenty of time to get drunk. I'm, I'm kidding, of course. But it's also plenty of time to do other things. And so eclipse viewing, um, I'm being rather frivolous about it, but it's very serious business. And I, I will be scolded and chided if this ever gets out onto the internet, because I because there are people that are truly dedicated to the drug of the eclipse. I've only seen four. I know people that have seen more than 20. And if you think about them being averaged 18 months apart, that's a long time to be. And they basically go, one eclipse, they're planning three eclipses out, thanks to math and the Antikythera mechanism and your iPhone. One of the slight drawbacks of April 8th, 2024, is it's right in the middle of the afternoon. So for those of you that have lived in the Midwest or on the Eastern Seaboard, four o'clock in the afternoon, cloudy or not? Okay, so the prime, the prime places, this is actually a climatological map of weather over the last 22 years, cloud cover, on April the 8th. And so you can see that blue is good, green is crap, orange is really crap, and reds forget about it, okay? And so the cloud cover goes, probability of cloud cover during the event goes from about 20% to about 80%, depending on where you are. And as I was saying earlier, there's this, there's this small quirk. There's a small quirk that when the sun comes around, remember that big shadow that I showed you? And this is a super top secret, right? Nobody wants you to know this. When that big shadow comes, some of the convection switches off. Like, 
the sun stops dumping heat into the atmosphere, and guess what? The atmosphere responds. And the clouds go away, magically. And then they come back again after you... But don't worry, the sun has no effect on our atmosphere. <laughs> the other big question, and who has uh, SkyMap or Sky Safari on their device? Hands up, admit it, you're a nerd. See one in the back. Thing takes up so much space. It's disappointing. But it's really brilliant for eclipses. Because you can go to where you're going to watch the eclipse and fast forward time to April 8, 2024. And guess what? So you'll have Uranus. You've got to get that right. Always have to get Uranus right. Would hate to call it Uranus. Jupiter. Venus, Saturn, and Mars will all be within a few degrees of the sun in the sky in the middle of the daytime. But just for a wee bit of added celestial bonus, we get a comet. So everyone that would worship eclipses and do weird things around eclipses can do doubly weird things because there's also a comet in the sky. Because we know that comets and eclipses drive mania. Okay. But it's pretty cool, and I think um, Mercury's going to make a, an appearance in the middle of the corona, I believe. So there could be some really interesting stuff. Uh, I won't get into this. This is really dull. But you can see, my friends, the prominences, because they're so prominent. There's the corona, because it's like a crown. There are helmet streamers, because they look like helmets. You getting it? And polar plumes, because, well, I don't know. But this is what the corona will look like on eclipse day, because this is a solar maximum eclipse, unlike 2017, which was a wiener and a solar minimum eclipse. Really boring. There's every likelihood that one of those big belches that I showed you in a previous movie will appear on that day. And you can be one of the first people in human history to witness a space weather event in real time with the naked eye. And that gets us to this bit. So the public service announcement, I've got to put on my best BBC voice, do not observe the sun without the aid of a device. Whether your device are solar filtered binoculars, pinhole cameras, a piece of welder's glass, you can go to your local home improvement store and pick up a piece of welder's glass, which I recommend, it's better than glasses. Are you making glasses? Oh, yeah. It's better than glasses because you can hold it up and you can change it. You, I have a piece that's polarized because I'm special. And when you polarize it and you flip it, the corona changes. <laughs> You're all going to go do that now. Get a piece of polarizer and a piece of welder's glass and you flip the polarizer. That's what nerds do. But doing... And, and this is hilarious bit, okay? So before totality, and this is, this is, I've seen this endless times now. And we made a very big point of this when we were talking to people come up to the eclipse in 2017. You can have your glasses on until totality, but then take them off. Because if you don't take them off, you'll see nothing. Okay? Because this is the one bit that I forgot to mention earlier. Does anyone want to tell me what the ratio of brightness is between the corona and the disk of our star? Anyone? Anyone? What's that? Cookie. We need a cookie. Yes. I no cookie. Cheater, your nerdness is acknowledged. <laughs> yes, the disk of the sun is a million times fainter than that cloud of gas surrounding it. So that just shows you how perfectly the geometry works out for the moon to block that. It's kind of incredible, actually. Really incredible. So remember, when totality happens, take the device away. Because otherwise, you're not going to enjoy uh, the event. And also, through your cameras and things, it doesn't do it 
it doesn't do the event any justice at all. So I'm going to go back in, for a little bit and, and look at some of the results, I guess, very quickly from the 2017 eclipse. You can see my airplane it is my personal private jet. And that other warlike thing on the far right-hand side from NASA, they were both uh, out in the air watching the 2017 eclipse. Um, the faked image on the bottom left-hand corner has got nothing to do with me. I was playing with infrared cameras, so this thing in the middle. I was playing all kinds of games. And then I was playing, also kidding on that I was a shrimp. Because I look like one. <laughs> but it's very funny that the mantis shrimp has this bizarre ocular propensity. Did you know that mantis shrimp see in polarization, polarized light? They find their way through polarization, not by the raw intensity of light, but the, a, a, a group of very clever engineers figured out that they can put a regular camera and use the same technology that a shrimp eye uses to observe polarization in the sun's um, atmosphere. We did that because polarization, of course, is um, light gets polarized in the presence of magnetic fields. So all of those images I showed you of magnetic fields earlier on, where the black and white things and all that stuff's going on, that you're seeing polarized light. And so the shrimp can see magnetic fields. Pretty cool. Even more cool when you stick it in front of your infrared camera. You get stuff like this. So I love this graphic in the top left hand corner. It's totally fake. Right? The two WB-57s just cruising there and the eclipse just pointlessly paused. Well, where was the picture being taken from? <laughs> Doofus. They could at least just have one and then you know, a wingtip and then, you know, but no. They went all in and faked it. All right? The images, however, from the WB-57, and if you've ever seen a WB-57, um, they used to have rail guns in them. Not anymore, they gimbal, they gimbal infrared, a suite of infrared cameras in the nose. And so they pitched the plane at a weird angle because the sun was 17 degrees in the sky. And then gimbaled the cameras and then the pilots had to lock this for two and a half minutes. <laughs> Spectacular. If you, if you get a chance to watch the ride along movie, it might make you puke. But the pilots did an amazing job and they centered the disc of the sun in those cameras and the, the rather funky looking image there um, was produced a couple of months later after they took all the jitter out. So it's, 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 it's a one of a kind, very expensive image looking at the sun's uh, outer atmosphere and its magnetic field. My colleagues at the Haystack Observatory, anyone familiar with the Haystack Observatory? Out at MIT? What is this one? You'll notice I have no caption. Yes, this is to see whose nerdness is high. <laughs> well, this is um, disturbances to GPS signal, or actually to the ionosphere. You know, the ignorosphere, the bit of the atmosphere that doesn't matter, where all the radio signals bounce off of. Well, as the eclipse traversed the country, can you see the bow wave in the ionosphere? Isn't that cool? Who says the sun has no impact on our atmosphere? Right? So that thing is actually, as it moves through the atmosphere, it's basically causing like what looks like a tsunami. That tsunami is radiating outwards in the ionosphere above us and actually distorting um, GPS communications with the ground. That's pretty cool. I love this movie. It's almost as good as one that you see when a volcano goes off. <laughs> Those are cool too. Like I said, we see this thing from a, range, a diverse range of platforms um, on the upper right hand side from the space station. Can you see the shadow? That's not CG, that's real. I don't think these are movies, I failed. Um, the, the, from our G5 on the left, so that fancy blue and white plane was doing an experiment from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. That's not easy for me to say when I'm uncaffeinated. Um, that's the image from the, the leading window. Isn't that cool? That's real. That was real. I didn't take it, but that was real. 
And then, of course, I love these time lapses from first contact to totality. One was taken, I believe, this one's from Glendale in Wyoming. And the other one's from uh, Oregon, because it's still lighter, so it was earlier in the day. But they're spectacular. And the, the, the technology and everything is, is amazing. I th oh, oh, shit, what happened? So I said that ride-alongs are pretty cool. I should have tried to get the WB57 ride-along movie, and everyone would be like... But the shadow... I don't think anybody really grasps what this means when you see the shadow passing across. And of course, I'm playing this at six times its normal speed, right? This took two and a half minutes. But imagine, put yourself in the place of, of the ancients. And one of these events just happened to happen over the top of your head. Who's not saying holy crap right now? All right, and so this is maybe where this is a bit more relevant to you, and I'm getting towards the end, but I acknowledge that I started 15 minutes late, so I can... No, okay. I was one of the core creators of a project um, called the Eclipse Mega Movie Project. Nobody's heard of it. It's okay. But the idea was that we would get people, and you can see the Generation 1 iPhone, right, here. We would get people strung out across the path of totality in 2017, you know, before the earth crumbled, and get them all to point their iPhones up in the sky and just print robot and for it to take a series of images. And if you think about it, across that 3,000 miles of, or 4,000 miles of continental US, if you've got 100,000 observers, you've got millions of images, hence mega movie, nerds. And so we tested this out in Cairns, Australia. And, and as you can, if any of you ever developed an app for the first generation iPhones, <laughs> I worked seven days straight and the still, damn thing still didn't work. So my prototype, this is, this is the eclipse as seen from my prototype on the beach at Cairns. So you see how crap it is. <laughs> Anyway, it's a beautiful citizen science project and it's come a long way in a decade. We were planning for 2017 and 2024 and 2011. This is the output from 2017. You'll see that it's changed a lot. We had over 1.8 million images submitted by Joe Public as this event crossed the United States. I was pretty proud of that. I'm not sure what scientific value is, but man, it looks good. I'm kidding. Actually, there's a small eruption goes off in the middle of the, the data set, and we're just, we're just now starting to play with it. You wouldn't imagine the amount of chicanery you have to go through to stabilize it even to this degree, right? You're talking about SLR cameras, you're talking about iPhones, you're talking about Android, you're talking about multiple generations, an extraordinarily diverse set of hardware. And that's the product, the product you get. For 2024, we're, we're aiming for 100 million images and the server to analyze them. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have a supercomputer at work. So I'm just going to leave you with the flyover because no, you know, it's like every bad talk starts with an overview. They also finish with a flyover. So this movie takes about three and a half minutes to play. So you'll see the shadow passing over the globe. You'll see the time of totality, so local time. The duration, remember I said it's about four and a half minutes. The swapping speed that this, the moon is flying at relative to us. So um, what? In the 90s, they tried to fly Concorde to keep up with the eclipse. Wasn't good for Concord. Concord no longer exists. And the, the width of totality is about 120 miles, but don't be fooled by that. If you can get onto the central line, do it. Because if you're, if you're even a couple of miles away from the central line, and believe it, we know the, the location of the central path to very high accuracy, right? Thanks to Google Maps. 
Um, so, you know, so now we're just going to make a new crease line that's going to curve up and across the country as people flood to the central path line. So I hope that all of you get the chance to observe the eclipse. If not, it will be webcast and it will look abysmal compared to what it will look like in reality. And I'm selling timeshares, but only for about four and a half minutes. In, um, what's the name of the place? There's a place in Illinois where 2017 and 2024 cross. Small town. It's renamed itself to Eclipse Town, Illinois. Clever. Right? And, and then I'm going to finish with an anecdote before John kicks me off the stage. When we were in Cairns, Australia, we were set up on the beach. Because remember, eclipses are better on a beach. And there was a whole bunch of very distraught people who had paid $30,000 to go to Cairns and be treated to an eclipse by one of the world's foremost experts in solar physics. And we're standing there still scrambling at the last minute trying to manually install our app on people's iPhones. Right? And the cost for this was a t-shirt. If I wasn't so fat, I'd wear my t-shirt from a decade ago. But the cost, the prize to anyone was a t-shirt, right? And these poor people, they were all distraught. And they'd been left behind because the, the guy that was leading their tour got chartered an airplane, a helicopter for one, and took off and flew up into the clouds to see the eclipse and left everyone else on the ground. <laughs> so they all wandered down to the beach and had a massive party with us because eclipses are best seen on a beach. They wouldn't have seen anything at the villa they were at. And believe it or not, the guy that took the helicopter even couldn't get above the cloud deck. So he saw nothing. So karma truly is special. <laughs> but those people who came down to the beach, because we got a phone call and we said, yeah, just come on down. You'll all get a t-shirt because we've got about 200 left. And they saw the most spectacular event over the Great Barrier Reef, and they left. They were pissed with the guy that, <laughs> like, I wouldn't say swindled, but close to, um, ditched him, left him in the helicopter. But they came down and had a great fiesta on the beach with us uh, and about a million other Aussies who were just crazy and awesome to be with. So if you can get there to see this next April, I fully encourage it. Um, if you need any further information, don't reach out to me. Reach out to John because he's an expert, I'm not. I'm just paid to act like one. Um, and I appreciate your time over lunch break, and uh, I hope your nerdness has now gone up a notch. Right, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Oh, I got one more thing I forgot. And I'm going to shut up and let this play. I hope it plays loud. Oh, no. What, what did I do? The other thing I got to do, because I was the director of the lab. Oh, no, it's not going to play, is it? No, it's muted. I'll send this out. It looks really awesome. I, I spent some of your taxpayers' money <laughs> to make an, the most, world's most amazing animation. <laughs> it's really good. I wish it was playing right now. It's playing somewhere. Relative to the Earth. Oh, there it is. And where the moon is relative between the two. All right, I'm going to put my mic close to this. The High Altitude Observatory has been studying the greatest show on Earth for over three quarters of a century. Not that kind. This show happens on an astronomical scale. Yes, we're talking about solar eclipses. You can predict when a solar eclipse will happen by knowing where the sun is relative to the Earth, where the moon is relative to the Earth and where the moon is relative between the two. A solar eclipse happens when the moon is directly in between the Earth and the sun. This causes the moon to cast a shadow onto the Earth, creating a spectacle like no other. You might ask, if it's that simple, why has HAO been studying solar eclipses for so long? Well, it's a lot more than just celestial shadow puppet shows. Actually, humans have been curious about solar eclipses since before written history. While a lot of ancients may have freaked out seeing a solar eclipse, some of them started observing just what was going on. 
They were able to deduce what was happening, see a pattern, and in turn be able to predict when and where a solar eclipse would occur. Armed with that knowledge, they could claim power over others by suggesting that they had power over the sun. We should all do that. The Babylonians came up with the Cero Cycle, a map that shows where and when a solar eclipse would happen. In fact, in 1901, off the coast of Greece, explorers found a strange device in a shipwreck. It's known as the Antikythera Mechanism, an ancient computer from around 200 BCE that can predict celestial bodies, phases of the moon, and, you guessed it, solar eclipses. But knowing when and where is just the start of the knowledge we've gained. You see, we are particularly lucky here on Earth because the moon's diameter is 400 times smaller than the sun's. But it's also 400 times closer to the Earth, making them appear almost the same size in the sky. That's pure luck. That allows us to get a look at the sun's corona, a Latin word in origin, today in Spanish means crown. The corona is an area of superheated plasma that surrounds the sun. We couldn't see it if the moon didn't block out the rest of the light coming from the sun. And what did telescopes find when looking at an eclipse? Huge solar storms, many times the size of Earth. That That's a prominence. From the sun. As technology has improved, we've learned more and more from solar eclipses. That's By me. By pointing a spectrometer at the corona during an eclipse, we accidentally discovered helium. That's also yeah. me. The four balloons, the only helium we That's knew also was me. on the sun. We've been able to lend evidence to Einstein's theory that gravity bends light That's my dad. Light from stars that appear close to the edge of the sun. And now we've built and improved on the coronagraph, a device that blocks out the sun and redirects the excess light so that scientists can study the solar corona whenever they want. And what have they discovered? Amazing things! Like instance, not to look at the sun through a telescope. Think of astronauts jetting up into cold, dark space, leaving our atmosphere behind. But the Earth actually lives in the sun's atmosphere. Told you that. Energetic particles shoot out from the sun and get deflected by the Earth's magnetic field. Do you feel That's the power? That's what keeps us safe and makes those beautiful auroras at the Earth's poles. Told you that. But the sun also produces coronal mass ejections, or Didn't CMEs. A big one can disrupt our magnetic field, interfere with satellites, communications, and in rare cases, even shut down power grids. Does this all seem familiar? We've even discovered solar cycles, patterns in the occurrence of solar storms that rise and fall every 11 years. Being able to predict these events is one of the many reasons HAO continues to study the sun, solar eclipses, and their impacts on Earth. And they are using every tool at their disposal. Telescopes, models, supercomputers, coronagraphs, satellites, observations, and good old brain power. Yes, there is still much to discover and more to learn about that great big life-sustaining ball in the sky. And HAO is on the case. And don't forget, on Monday, August 21st, 2017, a large part of North America is going to get an incredible opportunity to witness a total solar eclipse. Check out the HAO website for more information, because this is an event you won't want to miss. And you did. <laughs> so don't miss the next one. Thank you, Scott. Uh, we do have some time for questions, and I think oh, we're going to no. start. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You I got... tried to use it all up. I know. There's still time. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Kristen Weaver, who I think wants to make a, a, a plug, maybe. Or... Yes. So I don't have a question, but you heard discussion of the atmospheric effects of the eclipse. And some of you who are around in 2017 know that we did have uh, observations using globe tools for, during the eclipse. Um, atmosphere clouds, now we can add some background information like uh, land cover, also things if you have a weather station, things like wind and, and uh, humidity and all those other atmospheric effects. If you want to learn more about that, in the 4 to 5 p.m. session in the Marco Polo Ballroom, uh, Marle uh, Colon Robles and I are going to talk about Globe Eclipse and what you can do for that. And I know there's some other interesting sessions at the same time. We are holding monthly Globe Eclipse community conversations virtually. So if you can't make the session and want to be on that list, come find me. Perfect. Yeah, it's almost like we planned that, right, Simon? <laughs> the, the have the, the key. Yeah. Uh, nothing is random. Nothing's random, except yeah, you guys are smarter than you look. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so before I turn it over to the crowd here, Scott, you used an analogy about why it's important to travel to the path of totality. I heard you talk about this once before. You used a, a restaurant and a dinner analogy. Do you remember that? 
No? <laughs> I'm a bit worried now, unless it was about Paducah, Kentucky. Well, you said something to the effect that if you see a partial eclipse and you don't travel to the... Do you know it now? Can you? No, no, yeah, I mean, you're going to have to... I'm, I'm sure it was rather uh, flippant you know and may have included curse words. It, no, no, it, right. not, not the version I remember. But anyway... But I, I want you to repeat it exactly you, that way. You said, quote, uh, if you only see a partial eclipse, that's like driving by a restaurant. You get the smell of the restaurant, but you don't get the full flavor of the dinner that you eat inside of the restaurant, wow. unquote. That was that brilliant. so much more eloquent than I'm used to. <laughs> <laughs> questions from but it the, is true. Questions from the crowd. This may not necessarily be connected to air cribs, but I wanted to know if we will ever return back to where we are in 265 and a quarter days. Um, are we going to be in the exact same coordinates in space, like when we go around the sun? In what way? I mean, in what way? <laughs> um, the answer is yes. I just can't tell you when. Right? I mean, I think we sweep out almost every square radian of space. So, yes, but it could be three billion years from now. It could be four billion before we get engulfed by the red dwarf. Ah. Right. Yeah, my name is Albert. Hi. I'm from the edge of West Texas. Up in New Mexico, we got sunspot. So it's always pointing at the sunspot. But I work, I play around with the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm -hmm. I look at visible light and I do the radio. I am dividing those two events. I'm a ham radio operator. That's the radio. And the uh, visible, I have three telescopes. No, now, uh, we did have an annular eclipse a couple of decades ago. We had the telescope and we had the radio. You talked about the GPS. Uh, the sun, every 11 years cycle, we're on cycle number 24, ionizes the atmosphere. Yep. Now, with the ham radio, I want to put this in because you put the GPS. Uh, when the annular came about, propagation just went dead. Mm -hmm. And now, if you, you can, if you have a short wave radio, and I know you generations probably don't know what a short wave radio is, but when you do this observation, you can put it up there, listen to it, and see the propagation just go away. But I just wanted to let you know that. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful observation, and um, I talked to a lot of hams, ham radio operators about cycle 25, about what. You know, why, why is this cycle different? It's not cycle 19, which is the kind of halcyon days of, of ham radio. Um, but uh, cycle 25 is wickedly outperforming its predecessor, and it's got a lot of people confused. So, uh, but I, I don't know what the six meter propagation is like down in your neck of the woods, but it um, should be okay. Other than the fact that the sun keeps belching out radio blackouts, so. Hi, uh, my name is Noah. Uh, thanks so much for your entertaining uh, presentation. My question is not about eclipses, but the solar cycle itself, this 11-year cycle. Do we have any better understanding of what is, what's involved in that 11 years? Is, is there rotation going on, or why, what's the 11 years about? Do we know anything more? Are you a plant? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, seriously. Um, Oi, oi, oi. All right, how many hours have we got, John? Uh, you have all afternoon, Scott. All right, okay, right. Okay, I'll, I'll load up another talk. No. We, we are starting to get a good bearing on where the 11-year sunspot cycle comes from, and it's, it's, um, it's from, you know, I'm going to make the most glib, obvious statement in the whole universe. It's from the underlying magnetic field. But it's not in the way that appears in our textbooks. So, and those of you may, I'm, I'm part of a mad conspiracy theory that's trying to change all those textbooks um, because we've discovered something very different, which is kind of why I talk to a lot of ham radio operators. Um, 
the sun, the sun has this thing under, you know, the, the, the 11 year sunspot cycle gets a lot of press, but what doesn't get a lot of press is the thing beneath it, which is the fact that it has a 22 year magnetic cycle. So for those of you that worry about the Earth's poles, magnetic poles flipping every 200,000 years, we think. The sun does it every 22 years. Actually, 11 years is a one reversal, but a complete cycle is 22 years. And we've actually, in the process of, of, of mapping out that that 22-year magnetic cycle is uniquely responsible for the sunspot cycle. So the, it, it's kind of like the sunspot cycle is an interference pattern. So um, yeah, it's, it's a big mystery. It's, and it's the core of a lot of astrophysics. But that's, that's the very short answer to your question. Is like it's, it's the, and the problem is that people haven't looked at enough data for 100 years. Right? They've been observing it since 1600, but they've been kind of looking at the wrong thing. So um, the, mag the magnetism is the root of all evil. Maybe time for one more. One more question. Scared everyone. Didn't raise the nerd quotient high enough. Is my wait time okay, Scott? You want me to wait a little longer? No, you're good. Okay. Ooh, gravity. All right, let's give Scott a nice round of applause, please. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much, Scott also just asked me to say that he is available for weddings, parties, anything. He's very, very reasonably priced. Small fee. <laughs>